Carlyle in haiku form, which is the title of a beautifully illustrated, rather unusual book of poetry, which has just been published by Coldew Press. It's the poetic work of David Simmons with striking illustrations by Phil Hewitson and how, how to describe it? It is multifaceted, much like the city itself. And I think to me that that's the joy of it. it and it manages to capture Carlisle in all its multifarious moods, its history, its people, its industry, its nature, its fun, its humour, yet never using more than three short lines of non rhyming poetry. It could, this book, also be used as an alternative guidebook to the city, which is how we're partly going to use it this evening. So let us set off by meeting David. Well, you're about to find out where exactly. This isn't my normal cricket ground experience. Oh, right. No sound of bat on ball. Oh, yes, that reminds me of my haiku, the bat on ball. It's funny, but haiku, the short three-line poems, and they capture a moment in time. They're about nature, so we're, you know, we're in the midst of nature here. But for me, they capture a thought or an idea. For instance, I was walking along one Saturday morning. It was a nice morning. You could hear the birds singing. Of course, there was no cricket going on early Saturday morning. And I thought, well, sometimes you can hear the sweet crack of bat on ball above the bird song. An idea just came into my mind, and that's really often how I formulate the, the haiku. It just comes from an idea. And so, for anyone who is not familiar with the haiku form, right? Yeah. Where does it originate? Okay, it originated about 400 years ago now in in Japan. The equivalent in our time here is the writings of people like John Clare, uh, an agricultural labourer, mm -hmm. but. Since that time, haiku have changed. It's a very flexible form of poetry now. The Japanese used to write them, because they, they don't have the same syllables as we do, but they used to write them vertically, for instance. And of course, the essence of a haiku is its succinctness, its shortness, shortness yes, and, and the number of its syllables. It, indeed, it has a structure to it. Originally, people would stick to the first line of five syllables and the second line of seven syllables, and then the third line would be five syllables as well. 17 syllables in all, so that's <laughs> it's a very short poem. And I experimented as well, and I like playing with words, and syllables are about the sounds of words. As a boy, I used to play a lot of sport. I used to play cricket a lot, and I used to listen to the commentaries on the radio, West Indies playing, and there'd be his names, uh, Rohan Kanai, and Colin Cowdery, and tennis players, Illy Nastasi, and I just used to repeat these names because they sounded Rebel so... Rebel in the sound. I love the sound of it, yes. And of course, because haiku are all about syllables, if you're trying to construct a haiku with 17 syllables, you have to listen to the sounds of the words. A way of checking the syllable is by holding your hand under your chin. Once your chin touches your hand, that's a syllable as you speak. That's what I like about the writing. It became a physical thing as well, mm. speaking the words. And the rhythm and the sound, it's, to me, it's so important. So here we have a form of poetry that has its origins in Japan in the past, which we can find echoes of in English poetry as well. Why haiku and Carlyle? What made you come to that connection? I'd love to put my thoughts and experiences down on paper. I started writing little bits of poetry, but then I went through a period of physical poor health where I had to stay at home quite a lot. And I was looking after my neighbour's young three-year-old boy and the words he was coming out with, you know, he was learning language. And I was so dumbstruck really for the things it's he was... It's a fascinating process, incredible, isn't it? Incredible, yeah. incredible. Mm. And so I, I started to write down what he said, but from his point of view, I wrote a poem where he was speaking. My neighbours, they loved it. and we framed it and a friend had said why don't you try bookends poetry group they were just starting it up Malcolm Carson led it and so yeah I learned about all sorts of poetry from all over the world started to write little bits myself I went along to the Carlisle speakeasy that run by the late Nick Pemberton and then in 2018 I was sat in boxes at the speakeasy and a man had got up, I know him now as Tony Mason, he had asked for writing on Hidden Carlisle, I think he was doing some sort of project on it. 
fact got me thinking about writing about Carlisle. I'd lived in Carlisle for 40 years, but I felt that it, it didn't really push itself. People didn't really know where Carlisle is. You know, some people don't anyway. Some people think it's in Scotland. And having lived in the in the city for so long, you know, have a really a love for the city. So much green space. You can see the civic centre over there, and here we are with the river, cattle in the uh, Rickaby Park, and sheep. It's almost like an amphitheatre, this, isn't yes, it? As it is, well, yeah, it's a beautiful place. And there's so many green spaces around Carlisle. And of course the haiku form is very much associated with the natural world. Definitely, yeah. The haiku from the past, they were based on nature, but they go from the, well, the micro, the closeness, the, the intimate, the personal, to the macro, the wide world. The universal. Often, yeah, in just three short lines, from your fingernail to the moon, for instance. That's quite a feat. But for you, your haiku are intrinsically bound up with your sense and your impressions and your relationships with this place. Very much so, yeah. So we're starting here at the cricket ground. What was it about this particular place? Because I know it's not just the natural environment, it's what's been here before that can spark a Carlisle hiking. (laughs) To me, this is the origins of the city here. The River Eden is like a crossing point here. This place goes back to the Romans. They would come down and bathe in the river. Here's one I I start the book on. In the beginning, from the Garden of Eden, a city was born. Flow north, south, east, west. Willows shade the sandy banks. Romans bathe their sores. And I know you have room to play as well in your haikus. <laughs> and, and to play cricket. Wife of emperor, bathing, leg before wicket, Romans bowled over. Which is a lovely play <laughs> on everything. It just Let's encapsulates, hear. Hear. doesn't it? They're about to build a new pavilion over there because this one is always getting flooded. I'd written one about the naughty cricketer sat at the bottom step of the clubhouse threw his wicket away. There's a bit of fun. A bit of fun, <laughs> a bit in of fun into well. it, yeah, yeah. It strikes me that when, when you're writing a haiku, what you're doing is you're distilling so many different elements that could be to do with the senses, what you can see, what yeah. you can hear, what you can smell, yeah. what's going on now. That's right, you're capturing a moment in time. But you're also capturing echoes of the past, and you're also taking us on a tour, a story of a city. To me, the haiku are like footsteps through the city, not just physically through the city, but through the history, uh, through the way we live, through the way we work, the way we play, and the involvement in nature in the city as well. And it could also take you on a journey, which is about to take us on. I I think we need to get our footsteps underway. Yeah, well, I think we'd like to go up out of the gate and up onto the, you know, we can see it from here, up onto Cavendish Terrace, and we'll see the skyline of the city, and that's important to the book as well. I was watching a film, Terry Abraham's film, Life of a Mountain, and they were talking about Alfred Wainwright. He'd said that his first book was more like a love letter to the fells. And I thought to myself, well, that's really what I've done. I've done a a love letter to the city. Our footsteps have led us, uh, (laughs) not to the past, but to the current skyline. What a vista this is, David. Incredible, isn't it? Incredible. And you can see the fells. Behind Behind. the line, you've got the cathedral, the tower of the castle, and then Dixon's chimney, high to the right. When I was writing the haiku, I noticed from other haiku books that poems, they have a a title, but haiku don't have titles. So some of the haiku books, they have a a little squiggle or something between the haiku to separate them. So I thought, well, I'd like to put something in between the haiku, but I wanted something that would connect all the haiku throughout the whole book. A bit like footsteps through the book. I mean, I've done a lot of walking around the city, so I thought the haiku would be separated by a, a skyline of the city, but then I could have some little shoes as well. So what you've come up with is this beautiful motif that runs through the book. It's black and white, but it's suggested. It's almost like a whisper in between. <laughs> yeah, but it's that lovely crenellated, it's like you've got the turrets behind and then this pair of shoes just perch, yeah. ready for action. Ready for action, but I was trying to think about the whole of Carlisle and or the whole of history of Carlisle and people in Carlisle and connecting and linking them all. And everybody has to wear shoes. So these shoes, to me, they link all the haiku together in the story. They're footsteps through the book. 
they also relate to the history of the city, the skinning, the tanning from the cattle, the local industries. And I went to an exhibition at Tully House a few years ago when they brought up some objects that they'd had in storage and I saw these beautiful shoes. And it just so happens my mother was brought up on a small tenant farm in the Eden Valley and she would have worn these shoes. So there's a sort of personal link as well, but there used to be a leper hospital in Carlisle and did a little bit of research. There was a, a leper hospice treat five poor skeps of meal on the Feast of St. Nicholas, there's a haiku from the book. But the Feast of St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas is the part of the city down in Portugal, down the south. As part of the feast, the night before, I think it was the 5th of December, they put children's shoes out on the doorstep for gifts. So to me it's part of the caring culture that now, for me, pervades the city more than the conflicts of the past. Well, I feel like we've combined that beautiful illustration in our next stopping point, really, because we have followed our footsteps and we are neath the castle walls, mm. but we can also see so many aspects of Carlisle's industrial past and present in front of us. We've got Dixon's chimney poking through the trees at us. We've got the railway right below us and we've got this immense fortress to history looking up at the castle walls. What is it that you try to capture when you evoke these snapshots of these different, very recognisable places to a lot of people? Blood red silhouettes, hard against warm sandstone walls, weeping poppies born. The sandstone is so warm and beautiful, but it's got quite a dour history to it. There's yeah. a lot of blood been shared. Seeping November, poppies, silent affection, Red, red, remember. Jacobite inmates licked all traces of dampness from solid stone walls. Well, so what you're doing there is you're taking us back within the walls of the castle, imagining being imprisoned <laughs> in there and licking those walls because you weren't being given any water and you were being held in horrible conditions. And then you're also evoking a scene from just a couple of Novembers ago where we had that beautiful cascade of the poppies pop tumbling from the castle. Fantastic, wasn't it? It's so important that Carlisle could attract that sort of exhibition as well because of our, the military history. So it's a bit of a two-edged sword, really. We have the conflicts, but we're left with these beautiful buildings. What you also do, which we haven't really brought out properly yet, I don't think, in the book, is you also provide beautiful illustrations which I've spoken about a snapshot these are visual representations of some of the places that you are writing about and indeed some of the people that you are writing about. Part of the illustrations is bringing things that perhaps we've forgotten about or weren't aware of you know sometimes I've moved things about Phil Hewitson who did the illustrations I picked the locations, but I wanted to get the viewer, the reader, to think a little bit more about what is happening in these areas. There's one down the, the bottom of Colger Gates, the old temperance hall, and I picked that area for an illustration because there's so much history involved in it. And it's a building that you pass every day, perhaps, coming into work, but you wouldn't really notice it so much. It has history to do with the state management scheme, and there's so much history, and it's involving the people as well. They were working very hard in the factories. Cotton, spin, dye, print. Fifteen factories flowed, the you powered mill. That area down Shuttlegate, that was the heart of the city, work-wise. Even the football ground, the football ground used to be in, in Shadgate. That was the rich origins of Carlisle United. This is Brunton Park, touch going down the tunnel. Be just and fear not. So when you were putting the book together and possibly picturing the type of reader who would enjoy it, mm. it seems to me that there's a bit of a, a twin-pronged attack going on <laughs> because, because not only is this book an eye-opener for people who think they know the city, but it's also an introduction for people who don't. Very much so. I was really aiming it at a, a very broad section. Almost everybody, children as well. I mean, children write haiku in schools, probably better than we do. <laughs> 
and the format of the book with the handwriting. I'm trying to encourage children to trust in their handwriting. Which well, has an informality about it, it doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was interested in the whole community. The idea would be that people could come to the tourist information centre or Tully House or go into the bookshops. They could look at the book and think, oh, it's a way into the city. Just like Wainwright, you could use it as a means to go on a little trail around the city. Time for the final stop on our poetic tour of Carlisle with David Simmons, whose slimline, beautifully illustrated book, Carlisle in Haiku Form, is out now, published by Coldew Press. And let me just say, if you thought that one downspout was pretty much like any other, Think again. We're in Tully House Gardens, a beautiful, quiet, oh, it was going to be a quiet, peaceful. I wrote a haiku about the gardens, but I'm always trying to say that when we're walking around the city, perhaps we could be looking at other things and looking up at the beautiful buildings. And there's some things that you perhaps don't notice. We're sat here in the gardens, this beautiful old building. People come here and they have a chat and they have a cup of tea or whatever. They, they perhaps don't notice this beautiful downspout. It's a seven bay facade of dated lead rainwater heads. Best downspouts in town. Absolutely, without a shadow. <laughs> they are the most ornate downspouts I've never seen. But I had not noticed those. No, really. until, you... until you start to look. Yeah, this is the thing about Carlisle. There's so much to see. It's a matter of looking. Or and having like, the time to well, look. Or picking up this book up. <laughs> and then you think, what's he on about? Yeah. Downspout. And then you look. It's this place where we live, the art we create and the objects we cherish, what's contained in Tully House. In essence, absolutely, yeah. in a nutshell. And th the other thing, though, is that you find room here to bring in so many elements of this city's vibrant life. It's mm -hmm. not just about buildings, no, no. not just about people from the past. It's all about the, the, the whole section on work, working their socks off, and then the section following that on play can be magic i mean that's all about the city from babies in their prams right through the teens and youth to adulthood and all the culture within the city and the sporting life we have race course bell and bells dress first and place a flutter <laughs> hot tips for best hat and you, there's that touch of humor exactly, again which yeah. we heard with the cricketer sitting on the bottom of the steps right yeah, at yeah. the start yeah well it's so important it's a bit like the floods what i noticed about the floods i've written some haiku about the floods on devon and shore an alligator patrolled the seeking baby land it was about time of christmas it was a very emotional time and yet people would be able to see some humour in it. And that touch of Cumbrianness as well. There's yeah, even right. a little bit of dialect. Lyle touch of moose spray. Limousine cross, hairdresser, winds and pins, rosette. <laughs> well, if you've been down to the Rose Hill, to the auction marks... It's, it's another a, facet of the city's life. It's part of the city, yeah. Mentic hod and sway. Cumberland, Westmoreland style. Done wearing long johns. I have an illustration of looking from Eden Bridge across Rickaby Park. There's the old pier. Sometimes you will see sheep on it or cattle on it, but I've placed these two Cumberland wrestlers on it. It's a reminder as well of our past. But Cumberland wrestling is still going on today. But they're so visual, these haiku. I know we've used that word snapshot several times, but that's properly what they are. They are yeah, they're... But the photographs in your imagination, but you convey different generations. Kids eat, drink, chatter, computers find the answer, board books, watch from shelves, we're in the library. <laughs> <laughs> we are, and what I like about the book is that people, they have their favourites. There's so much going on in Carlisle, and there's so much in the book that people choose different things. For instance, we can see the vinyl cafe over there. Miss the smell of youth, searching for the sex pistols in vinyl cafe. Somebody, they'd like that one, and... Uh, well, why? It's because they were musicians and you know, it brought back their memories. But the other thing as well is you kind of bring things together within 17 syllables. So <laughs> Dan can karate, can do razzmatazz too, play can be magic. That's all to do with the Denton home area, lovely part of the city. But it's a city at work, it's a city yeah. at play, it's a city eating. It's a multicultural city. You are capturing all that within 17 syllables. Do you find it in any way constraining or is it the opposite? Is no, it liberating? No, it helps actually because it focuses the mind. If you only have very short lines in which to describe something, 
it makes you think more closely about exactly what words you're going to use. I could write it and then think, well, that doesn't quite work, so I'll, I'll try and find another word. And choice of the words brings out the visual, the history, all the different aspects. It's almost like something really concentrated. It's not diluted in any way, is it? It's like the, the proper cordial, neat. Yes, the little nutshells. Everything is, is contained within this haiku. Is it a little bit, dare I say, addictive? I mean, <laughs> I mean are, are you constantly well, look, I mean, spotting haiku? When, when I went to the first open mic evening at Bookends, I'd never written a haiku before, and I heard John Chambers, a local poet, read from his book Haiku, Poems Beyond the Mountain, inspired by the Lake District. He warned me very gently, he said, haiku can be addictive. But it was like I'd started to write some, I'd realised that they were snapshots of the city, but to capture this whole city, it's such a huge, vibrant place, I, I just had to write hundreds of haiku, and that's uh, that's what I did. I mean, it's like an odyssey, David, <laughs> yeah. really. Yeah, well, it continues. You can write haiku about everything, and in the book, I left a space at the end of the book and I said, that space has been left for anybody to write their own haiku or do a drawing. The story continues, it's not going to stop there. I've written hundreds of haikus about Carla, but I had to choose 164, say, to go in the book. There's plenty more. <laughs> I'm sensing a sequel. Well, this is first impressions. I mean, we did talk about that. The sequel could be called Second Thoughts. Well, I think, for me, this is what sums it up. Carlisle in haiku, poems that transcend the page. Fear not, and be just. In that haiku, the Carlisle motto is be just and fear not. And that's from the past, the conflicts in the past, the Scots and the English and the seeking of justice. But the city has changed. I end the book looking forward to the future. The last haiku is wearing the city. You know, we wear the city, wearing the city on our bodies, on our sleeves, in the air we breathe. We live in the city, so this is our city, and we care about it. If you enjoyed that haiku tour of Carlisle, then David Simmons' book, Carlisle in Haiku Form, First Impressions, published by Coldew Press, is available from bookends in Carlisle, and hopefully when places like Tully House and the tourist information reopen, you'll be able to get it there as well. It is full of poems that transcend the page. There are so many wonderful haiku i could spend i could just i could just go through it and it's like a selection box just pick out one from more or less every single page that would make you smile or would make you think about something or would create an image for you but if you are interested um it's published by called you press it costs eight pounds and it's called carlisle in haiku form